I would like to ask Emmanuel Bretel to go to the stage. And the friendly guy from the projector service told me I have to put off one or two fingers. One is for Mac or D digital, the other is for VGA. You know, you know which finger is what? Maybe. Good. So Joa will try it. And um, maybe, who has been here Monday? Good. Um, uh, you remember that uh, joke with the three uh, logicians going to a bar? Yeah, somebody told me there was a major bug in it, and he was totally right. Uh, that bug, uh, that joke was not passable. And now we will have quick service prototyping, and later we will have the bug resolution. Before we get uh, quick prototyping, I need Petar, Petar Viktorin. You are, Pe are you Petar? No. He is better, good. Okay, now please a big hand to Emmanuel Bretel about quick service prototyping. Like him on Facebook. Hi everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about Spart, uh, which is a library to quickly prototype services and basically help you into implementing things more than setting them up. Um, so what it takes to build a service. Uh, usually you have to handle command line arguments. You will set logging, you will set up the service, and you will also have your tasks that do the job. Um, you will have to manage them, and then you will have your implementation. Um, in Facebook, we love Thrift. We use it everywhere. Um, and this is what it looks like to make a simple service, kind of. Um, handle arguments, set the logging. Um, here I create my Thrift handler and uh, the Thrift uh, transport, and I start the service. What Spot does, it kind of removes some of, uh, of the, uh, the few steps you have to do. So you don't have to handle arguments anymore. Uh, you don't have to handle logins. You still have to set up the service somehow. Um, you don't have to manage your task, and you have to do the implementation because that's what you want to do, right? Um, so this is the same example. Here I'm importing stuff from Spot. Um, I'm creating my Thrift Handler. Uh, but I don't, then I just register the task and then I initialize the service. Where it gets a bit more interesting is if you start adding more tasks. Um, here I'm adding a periodic task that will be triggered every second basically. And all I have to do is I implement the task and register the service, uh, the, the task, sorry, and then start the service. And even more tasks. Um, there is a default uh, Tornado HTTP task that does not much, but then you can subclass that and basically do, the, do what you want with it. Um, there is other tasks supported like uh, queues and uh, directory watcher, dbus, fv303, uh, twistd. You might actually implement any other kind of task. Um, all it will do, it will, it will help you into starting the IO loop of your, of your task and shut it down when you need to. How to get it? Um, pip installs parts and um, otherwise you can go and get it from GitHub. And aside from that, we are also hiring, so you can come and talk to me if you're looking for something different. Thank you. Thank you so much. I need Udo Spalek. Uh, wait, 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 you have to be liked. You're from Facebook, so you won. Okay. Udo Spalek, Udo, you're here, very good. So to fix the bug with the three logicons, what I missed out, uh, the bartender asks him, do you all want to have a beer? And now the joke is easier to understand because the first one says, I do not know. The second one says, I do not know. The third one says, yes. This is a bit now it works. Bigger than I thought. Okay. He is still working. Uh, yeah. uh, who will be staying for Sunday in Berlin? Uh, make sure to look around because there is a crazy American billionaire who will be hiding Fine. money around Berlin. <laughs> and that's not even a joke, or at least I have watched TV this morning for five minutes, and they told there will be hidden envelopes of money, most likely even euros. So, our next speaker will talk about Blinky's Async Adventure. So I guess that's a return of the Blink tag in HTML. Your stage, give him a big hand. Woo. Hello, actually Blinky is this little guy here. Uh, he's blinking, 
uh, and here's Blinky source code. It's nothing complicated. There's some delays in a loop. Uh, and now Blinky is first nervous in front of this whole crowd, and second, he's sad because he doesn't have any friends. Uh, how do we fix that? We can use the threading module because threads are easy, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, this is different screen than I tried with. Okay, so uh, the only thing that changed here is there's a different function to print the blinkies. It's, you know, an external function there. Uh, we make more blinkies in a list and then we just start them and they're all blinking happily. The problem here is, uh, or well, Blinky's happy now because he, have, he has friends, until a system upgrade comes along with a new enterprise-ready print Blinky's 2.0 function that does a uh, little more than previously. And uh, we have trouble because all these Blinkies are trying to print themselves, uh, or, well, print all the Blinkies, so they're overwriting each other's lines and it's just a huge mess and we should, use some locking here, but you know, this is a problem that, you know, a library changed, we don't have control over it. Uh, so, you know, that's a problem. So what, we do, what do we do? We look at what Node.js does, and we use callbacks and futures. Now what this does is, uh, uh, every time we call a non-blocking or long uh, function, we uh, add a callback to it, specifying what needs to be done next after this uh, sleep is done. So here we schedule open eyes, here we schedule close eyes, everything works, everything's nice. Uh, the good thing is that uh, if you schedule something, the entire thing runs in a block, there's no interruptions. Uh, the print blinkies can't introduce any interruptions because it would have to change its signature, we would have to call it a different way. So everything's nice. The problem here is uh, these two functions are a loop, right? It, well, it's not really a loop, it's a trampoline uh, thingy there, but what we want is a loop, what it does is a loop, and we would like it to look like a loop. Uh, and this is what AsyncIO, which is AsyncIO solves. Somebody, some of you probably heard of AsyncIO. Uh, and uh, what AsyncIO does is let us uh, use a loop for it. We use this yield from, which uh, lets us know that this is a function that can result in a context switch. It can switch to another, you know, like thread of execution. Uh, so we have to be careful uh, because things can change from this function to this function, but in, in between these yield froms, it's again run in a single block without any interruptions. Uh, so I hope this cleared up for some of you what async IO is all about and all these other async things. And thank you. Thank you so much. You earned your lightning talk, man. Superhero card. And do you know what's the big brother of Blinky? Clippy. Who remembers Clippy? So you're trying to raise your hand. Do you need help with that? That's Clippy. And we also need Baptiste Mispelon. Mispelon? Oh, it's the French uh, Mispelon. Our next speaker will be Udo Spalek about the Triton Unconference in Leipzig 2014. The bartender says, we do not serve faster than light particles here. A tachyon walks into a bar. Now the stage for Udo about the Triton Unconference in Leipzig. Give him a big hand. Woo. Hello, my name is Udo Spalek. I come from uh, the Triton Foundation and I would like to invite you to the Triton Unconference in uh, Leipzig. It's a town nearby uh, Berlin on uh, <laughs> one hour of the way. Uh, 2014, uh, 11, 14. Uh, and uh, we are talking there about uh, the Triton framework and uh, other stuffs, the functional technical details. Uh, there are users, developers, and so on. You may ask, um, what is Triton? Because it's not very known, because it's just a small uh, 
uh, it has just a small domain of use. First for the name, we come from far away from planet Neptune. Um, one of the biggest uh, satellites is Triton with I, and we name our, um, our applications in the Triton framework all with uh, names from uh, the satellites of Neptune. Triton looks like this. You can see three clients. Uh, on the right side, uh, you see a GTK client. Uh, in the middle, you see uh, some, um, some web client, some uh, prototype of a web client. And on the left down, uh, you can see a client uh, which is uh, for Python, a library. Um, the architecture of Triton is uh, client server based. It's, uh, if you like, a multi tiers framework. Um, with uh, web connections, we use uh, several protocols to um, bind the clients to the server. Um, we use uh, usually for, for persistence uh, Postgres SQL or SQLite, um, and we support a little bit MySQL, but it doesn't work very good. Um, one special thing is the module tree uh, you see on the left uh, on the bottom. There, um, all functionality in the system is served uh, by modules, and uh, we have a good inherit inheritance uh, in the modules, so you can uh, build upon other modules your own modules for your special things you want to do. The special things you want to do um, with Triton is usually something like uh, accounting and invoicing, uh, sales purchases, inventory stock, uh, manufacturing resource planning, project management, and uh, party relationship management, which is a little bit bigger approach than um, just uh, customer relationship management. So it's a business-related framework. Who uses Triton? Um, the most prominent user of Triton uh, uh, is uh, GNU Health. It is um, a medical uh, record system. It uh, provides a hospital information system. And uh, for the future, it will provide a health information system because um, Jamaica decided to use uh, GNU Health uh, for um, organizing and uh, managing uh, their hospitals. This is one view of an earlier version of uh, GNU Health. You see a patient record uh, of a person, and you see it's uh, just the stuff you want to put in when you are a doctor, and uh, you want to see when uh, you have a patient in front of you. Just install Triton. Use uh, your favorite distribution. Um, you can uh, just install it, but you can also use PyPy, source packages, or whatever you need. So. I invite you again uh, for the Triton Un Conference. Thanks. Hallo Spalek, über die Triton Un Conference und er vergisst seine Superhero Karte, sein Verlust. Anton, I need you on stage. Anton Tiurin, are you here? Anton, you're here. Very good. Our next speaker will be Baptiste. Miss Pelon about yet another conference announcement. And he's adequately ready. Yes. Okay, give him a big hand for yet another conference announcement. Baptist. Thank you. Hi everyone. Like I said before, I'm Baptiste. I'm one of the Django core developers, and I'm here today to announce you yet another conference. I hope you're not bored of this. So first, I'm going to tell you a, bit, a little bit of the story behind this conference. Last month, I was on a train in Italy back from another conference. I was with my friends, uh, Mark, Daniele, and me. We were all on this Italian train, so we had a lot of time to chat. And we were thinking uh, about Django, about how the Django, the Django source code is a bit complicated, and there are some parts that only a few people know about. And uh, when we try to... Uh, get other people to contribute, we often need to review their code. And if their code touches uh, these parts that we don't know about, it makes it really hard for us uh, to accept it or reject it. So we are looking for a solution uh, how we can get this knowledge to spread inside the, the Django team, but also inside the community. So we started thinking, what if? What if we could put the whole Django team inside one room at one time? How would it look like? <laughs> Maybe something like this. But seriously, we had this idea for a conference, and we called it Django Under the Hood. The idea is this. We're going to have a two-day conference. On the first day, 
There is going to be, there are going to be eight talks, eight one-hour talk, very technical by prominent members of the Django community and the Django core team. This is the, the program that we want to uh, work with, and it's not been fully announced yet, but that's what we're running with. Six heavily technical talk to uh, spread the knowledge that these people have amongst the core team and amongst the community. And I know you're all very curious because this is all very exciting. Where is it and when is it? It's going to take place quite soon, actually, on the 14th and 15th of November. This is a Friday and a Saturday, and it's going to take place in Amsterdam, which should make it easily reachable for a lot of people, we hope, in Europe and in the whole world. And the reason I'm standing here today, not just to announce it to every one of you, but we're also looking for sponsors. We're looking for sponsors to give us money so we can bring as much of the Django core team and of the Django community to this place at once. We're going to use the, the money we get for travel grants to get everybody, as many people as we can, to this conference. So if, you, if all of this interests you, or if you want to get in touch with us, our website, which we just launched yesterday with the help of the awesome Olas, is djangounderthehood.com. You can reach us at hello at djangounderthehood.com or follow us on Twitter at djangounderthehood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Baptiste. Our next speaker will be talking about the configurable, omnipotent, custom application integrated network engine. It will be Anton Turin, and I like long titles that fills the gap between two talks. So, while he's setting up, I set up an email address that's jokes at lightningtalkman.com. So, if you think those jokes suck, mine are even better, mail them to me. If you find bugs, mail them to me. And until you mail, give Anton a big hand for the Configurable Omnipotent Custom Application Integrated Network Engine. Anton, your stage. Hello. Uh, my name is Anton. I work at Yandex. Uh, three days ago, I introduced you one of our open source project uh, named the Elliptics. And today, it's time to another one project. Uh, it's a project named Cocaine, and it's an uh, application cloud platform. Uh, it's platform as a service, and uh, this name means nothing. Uh, this name is just a name, and uh, I hope that each of you will see a technology behind this name and not only a name. So, uh, we started to develop uh, Cocaine at Yandex uh, two years ago to solve problem with unifying our infrastructure as uh, some of you could know, Yandex is quite a large company, and uh, there are about hundreds of different projects uh, uh, in Yandex. So it's easy, hard to uh, it's quite hard, sorry, to maintain these projects. Uh, so we started to do this awesome thing. So uh, five minutes not enough uh, to describe you, to introduce you all features of our platform. So I try to introduce the most important of them. First of all, uh, Cocaine has a pluggable architecture, and each component of this platform is a plugin. Uh, when it comes to storage, for example, uh, it's used to store your code, to save, uh, to store applications of your settings, and uh, it is provided as a service uh, for read and write uh, for your applications. We use elliptics. Uh, and uh, if you want uh, to use uh, Cassandra, for example, you just need to implement your own plugin, and uh, after that it will work uh, by magic, and you need not uh, change anything in your code. Uh, we have automatic uh, load balancing. We use IBVS to communicate our well-known entry point to the cloud with uh, backends. We have all information about uh, size of queues and each uh, worker of your application in the cloud. So we could spawn more workers for you if uh, load is loading, uh, is growing now, sorry. And uh, if there are a lot of workers uh, in idle state, we will kill for you. Uh, of course, we have isolation. Uh, it's based on Docker technology. Thanks for Docker team for that awesome thing. Uh, we support um, any language, of course. Uh, but we have frameworks only for seven languages. Uh, Python, C++, Go, Ruby, Perl, uh, Java, and Node.js. Sorry for the last. And uh, it's easy to write your own framework. Uh, uh, framework uh, implements I.O. between uh, core of platform and your worker. 
Uh, and uh, for example, Python framework is written on pure Python and uh, it's easy to maintain, it's easy to explain to somebody and it's easy to understood and it's really necessary uh, to write frameworks on pure language. Flexible protocol, uh, we um, don't use HTTP in our platform. We have our own protocol. It uh, supports uh, streaming, multi, um, It looks like HTTP uh, 2.0. Uh, and uh, it uh, allows you to communicate between your applications uh, in, in the cloud. And for example, if you um, have a huge monster, uh, big application, you could divide it into parts and uh, after that, uh, communicate between them without a reinventing communication system. Uh, so, um, the bottom line is if you need uh, your own infrastructure, if you um, need your own private cloud, uh, you should take a look at this project and uh, I'm glad to ask, oh, sorry, I'm glad to answer any questions about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We need Lukas Bednar on the stage and we have the first crowdsourced joke. Knock, knock. Race condition, who's there? That brings me, is Lucas here? Lucas, knock, knock, get to the stage. There are only two hard things in computer science. Cash invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. Now enough with the jokes. I wanted to try something different. Nah. No. 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 Woo! It's shamelessly stolen from Bobby McFerrin. And he was telling the story that it worked in every culture. So I was thinking, will it work in programmer culture? I have to test it. And thank you so much for being part of it. You remember Pavlov being in a bar, the doorbell rings, and he says, oh shit, I forgot to feed the dogs. <laughs> Black screen. I remember the blue screens. That was my first deployed, uh, largely deployed application. The customer just deployed some spare server standing around. And regularly, it was a virtual machine running on faulty memory chips with the wrong driver. And I was deploying it with PostgreSQL 8.0 beta 3. And it crashed every day, the server, not PostgreSQL. And I didn't know it. Uh, it took something like two weeks until somebody called me. Oh, it's wrong. We need the next one. It's harder to find. Vlad, Vlad and Zalin. Vlad, you're here. And he's got a Macintosh, so that's a two or one. You, you know. None. One. So it took two weeks or three weeks until somebody reached me by phone and told me, oh, the application is not working, can you take care of it? I tried to log on the server and to no avail, I reached the system administrator and he told me, oh, if I would always call you when the server blue screens, you would have a bad time. And there was running a better version of PostgreSQL, which nowadays is discontinued because it's unsupportable but it never lost any data. And what did Vlad and Kalin at EuroPython give him a big hand for his story? And <laughs> don't start yet. I need Abraham Martin to move to the stage. Very good. Now you can start. OK. Hi, I'm Kalin. There is Vlad, my colleague and friend. And I'm going to talk. Uh, about what we did at EuroPython. It starts at the party, <laughs> like everything starts at the party. 
but there we kind of did the party of our own. Uh, and at that party, we reversed the APIs and created Zippa, which are the APIs reversed, and they are, it's a package for magic Pythonic REST clients, and I'm going to finish with the buzzwords right now. So what you can do? For start, you can import from Zippa any kind of client, REST client you want. Like here I'm importing the GitHub API. Under the hood, it magically transforms your import into a client. It translates that api-github-com into api.github.com. And you can do, uh, you can get resources like this, very simple. It translates gh.user into slash user automatically, and you can print the login name or do whatever you want with it. You can easily create and delete stuff like an, a gist. Uh, what's the most awesome feature? It supports simple iterators. You can iterate throughout a resource, and it follows the link header and actually iterates through the entire collection. And it also supports filtering those iterators, so you can iterate through all Django repositories sorted by creation orders, by their creation order. Everything it does, it's not... Uh, hard-coded into the client, so it's a general purpose. What, in this uh, example, it's not that we implemented the GitHub client, we just used Zippa to create a GitHub client. So, where to use it? You can use it to quickly access any API without a native client, given that that API is written restfully. <laughs> and also to test your own APIs. Or if you want to develop an API and you don't want to write the client, you can just give Zippa as a client and that's it. We want to thank uh, Claudio Popa, David, Daniel Haler, which contributed already to this project, and also the hacker fleet. We just launched the pip package from the boat yesterday. Uh, and you can join us tomorrow. We want to make it past the Python 3 tests. Right now works only on Python 2. And we also need to write documentation and examples. And that's it. Thank you. Abraham, please set up. I need Pablo Zelayes and Zelia Quintas or Zintas to come to the stage. Can you make you show yourself so I know you're moving? And the first crowd crowdsourced joke was by Emil Stenquist, and that was the race condition. And I got a follow-up joke which was linked to an external website, clickbait in jokes contribution. You can't believe it. So that joke is, a programmer has one problem. He thinks, oh, I will solve it with threads. Now two has problems now. <laughs> Foreman client. Okay, hello everyone, and sorry for problems. <laughs> so it's, it's Lucas. Ah, that's yeah. the race condition, absolutely. <laughs> we were using threads here. <laughs> Lucas, the foreman client. Your stage. Um, okay, hello again. Uh, my name is Lukas Bednar and I work for uh, RevMQ infrastructure department and I would like to say something about the Foreman client. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you, everybody is familiar with the Foreman. This is actually what they say about themselves. It's a complete life cycle management tool for physical and virtual servers. What, what actually does it mean? It's, it takes care about uh, provisioning machine, configuration machine, and also it monitors your machines. Uh, it is able to manage uh, many services like TFTP server, DNS, DHCP, uh, Puppet Master, 
BMC, uh, BMC it's some kind of uh, encapsulation of power management. That means you don't need to care about if it's a bare metal machine or a virtual machine, if it's controlled by OpenStack or whatever. You just uh, want to proceed with power cycle and that's it. Uh, here is just a small list of supported uh, compute resources. Um, of course, bare metal, OpenStack, uh, Ovid, uh, EC2, and more. Uh, the most important thing for automation purposes is uh, it has a REST API, so we can script everything. So let's find suitable web for the Python. But unfortunately, there was nothing. So no problem, we can write it and share it. It wasn't so hard, you know, it's just uh, repairing the uh, request to, to the APIs, and here it is. But uh, for man is uh, quite a uh, young project, and uh, it's under fast uh, development. Uh, so the API is changing, logical structure, uh, there are new version of the API. So we had to introduce a lot of logic into it, and uh, uh, it uh, got the quite complex and uh, hard maintainable. Also no schema available, so it was the problem. So I, we just got rid, uh, got sick of it and uh, set the stop. And we just took a look and there was the good documentation uh, which was auto-generated from the API. So let's look at it. Look, look at it. Uh, here is the HTML form. Uh, it pro, it's, uh, tells you everything about the, uh, all methods you can uh, call, call, also about the parameters and so on. And also, it provides you in the JSON format, so that's, that's actually, let's generate for the client on the fly from the documentation, and it worked. Uh, actually, uh, we implemented it for version eight, uh, version one, uh, but we got it for free uh, also for version two because we auto generated it from the documentation. Uh, once we generate it from the documentation, it also has in, uh, documentation included inside of the module automatically because we have all documentation, uh, you know, there. If you are if you are interested or you need to manage your infrastructure by foreman, you can fork uh, the, this project and and play it with it. But uh, I have a second thing why I'm talking about. Because uh, yesterday I uh, attended the uh, presentation about uh, Elasticsearch clients, and actually they did the same. They followed the same pattern. Uh, you know, I was considering that uh, like the crazy idea to generate uh, API from the documentation, but apparently I'm, I'm not alone who, wanted, who, who just did the same. Uh, also the REST coder, but uh, I was trying to use that, but it wasn't compatible with the uh, format documentation. So, so that's it. So I think it's an interesting idea to, to try write some kind of clients driven by AP documentation. It improves uh, documentation of the API, and it's, it's fun. <laughs> Thank you, and if you want, use it and... Thank you so much, Lucas. Now, Abraham, are you? Are you Abraham? Yep. Very good, he's Abraham. I have to thank Patrick for the uh, threats joke and another crowdsourcing joke from Uwe. What's the favorite activity of bits? No, they drive on the bus. So, if you have other crowdsourcing jokes, uh, cr sources, jokes about crowdsourcing, you can send them to jokes at lightningtalkman.com. You can also send jokes that are not about crowdsourcing. I'm crowdsourcing jokes to jokes at lightningtalkman.com. And I'm very happy I, to have it in a clear type thing. Abraham Martin of the University of Cambridge will talk about HSTS. Give him a big hand. And start. Hello. Um, how many of you are using HSTS? Well, only a few, 10 as much. So, but how many of you know about HSTS? Oh, okay, so the same hands. So, <laughs> HSTS is basically HTTP strict transport security. It's an RCC which is really, well, it's practically new because services, you know, take a lot of time to be approved and, and 
to be practical, uh, to be in, in a final product. So basically, HTTP uh, strict transport security solves the following problem. Um, let's say we, have a, we, we are browsing uh, our bank web page and we type bank.com, which is HTTP. And we get a response from uh, the bank web page where it shows the welcome page in HTTP and it has a button uh, that follows uh, the link to the secure login using HTTPS. And also, and sometimes, they also send us cookies or session with, with session content inside. Uh, basically, when we click the login button, we are redirected using our browser to an HTTPS secure login in our bank uh, web page. Uh, but imagine you are in an insecure place, for example, EuroPython, where anyone can just create an access point and you maybe doesn't notice and you connect to it. And you can act as a man in the middle uh, within the network connection and, and, and you. So you send the same request, bank.com, and instead of, well, they copy the same web page, they send you the same web page, but with a little change in the URL. So you end up uh, connecting securely to this different web page uh, because it still has a certificate which is valid, but with a different typo. Um, some, well, most of the users doesn't check if the, there is a green log um, or even an extended certificate, which also says the company name, uh, in this case PayPal. So most users won't notice that they have changed the, the URL and they are now in an unsecure web page that is fake. And even when you start an HTTP connection, you end up uh, sending the, well, the web server may end up sending the, um, set the session uh, cookie and all the cookies through HTTP, although you later connect to them using HTTPS. So you could think, okay, I'm safe because I have my web server, which uses redirect all the HTTP calls to HTTPS, but, if you have man in the middle and you send the same request, the man in the middle uh, also can send you an HTTP redirect to uh, a, different, uh, 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 a different URL and you will notice. So at the end, do you have this configuration, but the man in the middle does the same thing and we have the same problem as the beginning, so it doesn't solve the problem. So we have the HTTP strict transport security the rescue, and basically what it does is the first time we visit the web page, we send the request, and then we get back the web page plus a header that is called strict transport security. So the browser learns that this web page from now on you, it should be accessed using uh, HTTPS only. So you any other request that you send it will transform to an HTTPS connection. The same goes for if you have your configuration uh, as a redirection. It doesn't matter if you first serve an HTTP uh, web page and then you redirect to an HTTPS or you do it using your web, your web server configuration. So the next time the user tries to go to bank.com using HTTP or rather, as most of us does without putting HTTP or HTTPS, the browser knows that this web page is in this secure list and doesn't allow you to do a request using HTTP, but instead it changes the URL to HTTPS. So it's impossible for a man in the middle to have this connection and redirect you to another URL. And it's really, really easy. You only have to include this on your Apache configuration. And also, it's almost compatible with all the web browsers. So, Please, keep your users safe. Very exact timing, Abraham. That's very important for browser security to have exact timing. Uh, we need Pablo. Pablo Zelayas and Zelia Zintas, Kintas. Uh, I've got the Latin pronunciation to the stage. And I need Eve, Eve Hilpisch. 
Eve, are you here? Are you crushing another economy with some hedge funding? No, um, as we are talking about banks, do you remember that ATM, who was addicted to money? He suffered from withdrawals. <laughs> okay, that worked well. Now our next speakers, speakers will be Celia and Pablo about the Pi Argentina community. Yeah, you, you look quite ready and now you, you're pulling back. Give him a hand until he's ready. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, this is uh, my first time here in EuroPython, I think, for Celia as well. Second. Second one, but it's the first time we're going to talk a bit about uh, what the Argentinian community in Python is doing. So, it's a bit of a lot, so we're going to be quick. So, well, this is a, to use a bit of enterprise philosophy, we have a mission and a vision uh, <laughs> to integrate like the Argentinian Python users to share experiences and to spread the Pythonic word, like among developers, also in companies, universities, and more important, like to, to foster and create like a very active community. Uh, also like the Python, Python Argentina community is the point of reference for Python use and distribution. And okay, we have a lot of activities, like uh, the community has been growing steadily, like we've reached like a uh, 1,300 members only on the mailing list, very active by the way, like more than 400 messages per month. We have a lot of, a lot of members not only for, from Argentina but also from other Spanish speaking countries, even from Cuba, it's not on the map but there's a Cuban guy, I'm working with him. And okay, we have also a very active uh, IRC channel. I don't know why but the most active members call it the channel of love, you gotta ask them. And uh, we have a very active also web portal. And, yeah, just a minute, okay. Uh, very regular meetings all over the country, like most of the times in Buenos Aires, but all over. Great chance to meet to face, face to face, to grab some beers and talk about the future of Python and the world. And okay, let's go to the events. Like, this is the, the, the event I like the most, are the Pi Camps. Uh, we also have conferences, but this is the, the, the one I like the most, like it's just, it's like a four day sprint. There are also like sort of like lightning talks and a lot of projects. People from very different backgrounds, like I don't know, on the, on the last one we saw like a 40 year old Googler explaining very basic stuff to an 18 year old newbie. And a lot of like very interesting uh, products have emerged from this. Maybe some of you, if you work on mobile, you know Cocos 2D. And, okay, now uh, let's move on to the, we have done six already. Uh, we also, uh, the community also translated the official Python tutorial to, to Spanish, and it's available in printed and PDF versions. It's being actively delivered to universities and schools. Uh, and we have a couple of conferences, like uh, since 2009 we have uh, PyCons, Every time in a different city, like Argentina is very centralized and we try to fight this by organizing in different cities. Next one is going to be in October in Rafaela. And we also have a lot of local events like Pi Days which, with shorter and quicker talks, but a lot of them and with a main focus on introductory topics. Okay, and now to use the last two minutes, uh, Celia is going to talk a bit about another conference. <laughs> Okay, I'm the sci-fi part of the, of the group. We make uh, the past year the first sci-fi con in Argentina. We make it in Patagonia. We have uh, three, two trainings, uh, several talks, international keynotes with Bravo from Machabi Development. We have also a parallel uh, workshop of robot programming for high school students. Uh, we have 200 participants and 60 students working with, uh, my, with robots and Python. The next one is in October. In a few weeks, it's going to be open to poster and talk submission. And it's going to be in Bahia Blanca, close to Buenos Aires. 
Also, this year we have a PyLadies group that are already working with us in the SciPy conference organization, and they having a lot of meetups in the Django Girls. So this is where can we find us, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Pablo and Celia. <laughs> this month brings a lot of good news from South America. First we win the World Cup and then you tell us about a great our, community in our Argentina. <laughs> you have to go yeah, yeah, and we have, we have a short question. What is the best way to divide eight? Eight. Seven and one. <laughs> okay. Another crowdsourced joke by Morten Breckigwold. An SQL statement walks into a bar, he sees two tables and asks, may I join you? I'll use that again at PGConf Europe. I need Erika, Erika on the stage. And our next speaker, Yves Hilpisch, the Python quants, about, oh, Python quant platform. I was reading PQ as a Python Q platform. So give him <laughs> a big hand for the Python quant platform. Well, thank you. Uh, some of you might know me, and if you know me, you know that I'm doing fi uh, finance mainly with Python. Actually, so this is about a project that we started recently. It's very nascent, but I just want to demonstrate what we've been doing so far. It's about web-based financial analytics and rapid financial engineering with Python, something we do since quite a while, but now we are trying to unify and uh, yeah, to bring it on a single platform. Um, it has collaborative features, it scales, it, uh, yeah, it is for individuals, teams, and companies, mainly for all those who are doing quant finance, actually. Um, the analytical core components are mainly comprised uh, of the things that we've been doing since years right now. We started Decision, uh, what you see on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, a couple of years ago, I think, uh, six years ago. Uh, DX Analytics kind of a recent uh, thing that we did, and we're now using IPython and all the things uh, that the wonderful Python world offers us uh, to integrate this on a platform. Uh, actually, I mean, it's powered by a full-fledged Python stack, Anaconda. I don't know if you're using Anaconda, but if you're not, just give it a try. It's a wonderful distribution by Continuum Analytics. Uh, all the folks from Continuum are around. Uh, you have to try it. Uh, we love it. Uh, you should love it as well, so give it a try. I've been written this book, Python for Finance, for people who want to use Python in the finance space, but still, there are a couple of hurdles to take, and what we want to do with the platform is kind of to make it as simple as possible to implement financial workflows and applications by using Python. Um, the project currently uses a standard Linux server. There's nothing special about that. Python for anything in the back end and jQuery in the front end. The status is uh, we're only eight weeks in, <laughs> so it's pre-alpha. Uh, we use it internally, for example, for trainings. It's pretty good. Um, and what we have achieved so far is that we have integrated IPython notebook and the shell. We have a file management. We have browser-based shell access to the server, uh, which you can use for WIM editing. I will show this in a second. Uh, Git integration. We have a chat room, uh, user administration under the hood, and this is what we've been focusing on, actually, that we started building it from bottom up, actually, using Linux and everything about rights and roles and group management and so forth to have kind of a collaborative, scalable environment. But let me come to the brief demonstration. This is how it looks like. Maybe I should do it a little bit. Oh, it doesn't show on the left-hand side, unfortunately. Is it my fold? Yes, lots of stuff missing. Ah, here we go. Perfect, thank you. I don't know if I was that. <laughs> so you see, we, we have been writing a wrapper around uh, IPython, but I will show this in a second. We have a file upload, a file management system where you can upload, where you can download uh, stuff, for example. I can navigate uh, the platform here, for example, to the public folder. Someone else has done, obviously, an untitled notebook in here. I could maybe try to delete this in a second. Yes, I really want to do. Oh, well, this is not your notebook. You're not allowed to delete that. So it's pretty safe to share stuff, and you can be sure that you and only you are allowed to change or to, to delete stuff that you've been providing on the platform. So we have this complete uh, user management and rights and roles stuff in there. You see the shell integration here, where you can, of course, run IPython shell in there. Uh, you can have WIM editing on the server, so this is a file from the server where I have, uh, the WIM editor open uh, to edit the file, but of course you can edit any other file. You can have the Python shell, of course, again, the Hello Europe Python, a uh, simple example, and you see it's all Anaconda powered and it's uh, based on Red Hat Linux server. So again, nothing special about that, but try it out, Anaconda. And I think the main thing where people are using uh, right now in the world is um, 
the uh, IPython notebook. If I fire this up, and you see I can change a little bit the thing that we have a full uh, workspace. Takes maybe a second to load it, I don't know. I'm gonna do it again, I don't know. I did it a couple of times before. <laughs> There's always when you do a live demo, actually. Um, so don't use this tool for <laughs> sub-second uh, trading. <laughs> uh, here, for example, you see another one which opens immediately. I don't know why this uh, isn't firing up. If the DX Analytics one, you see here, of course, uh, you can do all the things that they used to do in, uh, with an IPython. Here we are using our proprietary analytics stuff. For example, do complex derivatives analytics here for multi-risk uh, derivative, uh, which is pretty hard to value and see. We can even do numerical uh, stuff, which is uh, very compute intensive in all the things. The last thing I want to show, is actually really the last thing. So we have something like a chat room where you can chat with people, with colleagues. You can upload files, for example. We have in included something that you have a uh, little profile, so a little bit of a uh, uh, internal social network, and what we also have implemented is that you can upload, for example, research paper or whatever, and you can share with your colleagues, have a look at the uh, PDF file. This is very interesting, a new publishing, uh, publication which might be of interest for what we are doing. So if you're interested in that, um, actually it's pre-alpha, as I said, but what we have uh, done is a, a, pre a simple landing page. You can go to quant quant-platform.com, and there on the platform you can register if you're interested in it. Thank you. If you wish about the Python Quant platform, while Erika is setting up to talk about Code Week in Europe, I need Remco Wendt. Remco, are you here? Can you move? Yeah, and be prepared. Very good. As we were talking about database jokes, we were very happy that the British Met Office moved all its stuff to PostgreSQL because it's a great database and I love it. On the other hand, I'm not really sure why the British Meteorological Office really needs a database to forecast the weather. <laughs> now we'll have Erika, and she will be speaking about the Code Week in Europe. Give her a big hand. I made sure that I'm a first name basis with her because I would not dare to pronounce your last name. Erica. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, yeah, hi, I'm Erica. Um, I'm not Erica Erica, I'm Erica Pogorelis. This is how I pronounce my last name. Um, and I want to um, talk to you today a little bit about me. This is my uh, second time at Europe Python. And I work with peer to peer university. Um, we are a distributed team, so we don't have an office. And we're all about peer learning. Um, so what I do there is I help people, uh, I help, I build tools to, to, for people to actually be able to learn from each other, to teach each other, and stuff like that. And I use Python all the time, which is cool. So one good project that we have is uh, a project called Mechanical MOOC, which is a, a, a kind of a platform that we use. Um, and one of the content that we have, one of the courses that we have is gentle introduction to Python. So this might be um, a hint for you if you need uh, to build a community in your local space and you know, to learn Python. And this is essentially a, an experimental MOOC, which means that it's headless. So there is no uh, central um, uh, instruction there, really. You know? So people are just... What we did was, was we grouped the cohorts locally, and now the t people are learning from each other and teach each other. And all we do is fire up an email once a week, you know, to suggest the topic that they should learn about um, to progress slowly. So, another uh, good, actually, another good uh, project that we are doing is play with your music, and this is actually. Uh, collaboration between New York University, peer-to-peer -peer university, MIT Media Lab, and Peter Gabriel. Um, he was actually kind enough to provide us with all the materials that learners can actually build upon. They can reverse engineer them, and you know, he's um, even included in the process of learning with, with interviews and stuff like that. And we were really grateful that he provided us with that, because that really eases up the tension in the copyright sphere. Um, so, since uh, we already know now that we are quite musical, we can sign up for that course too. 
And this is my afternoon project, my Code Cats project. Um, this is a group of young women and men, mostly women, because our one rule is that there has to be more women than men. But we are um, learning to code, you know. And um, we don't have a sponsor. Not that we are searching for one right now, but it would be nice to have some. <laughs> Um, so the aim is to show um, these people that want to know about our work proce process. Um, the aim is to show them how a, sim a simple app can actually come to production. So how do you start it and everything else. Um, and we meet every week without exception because we believe that you, know, you have to be very consistent with learning. So um, we did something very special this year. The European Commission actually um, trusted it with, with the task to enable people to um, participate in a code week EU. Um, this is a, thing, a very simple Django app. We decided that we are gonna um, put our code kittens, which are you know, people who are actually not, um, that, they don't know about programming that much, they will actually build it, and they did. And first they did a mock-up you know, to demonstrate how it will work or how it will look like, and then they researched about tools, and they decided to use Django because it has already built in a lot of stuff, and we decided to give them the deadline, you know, so, which made them really kick up a gear. And um, they, they, all of a sudden, suddenly, everybody was finding more time to learn, which was great. And it turns out that the, if we let them go through the turmoil of maintaining their own code, they actually learn a lot, you know, because now after six months, they actually know um, where did they write the spaghetti code and stuff like that, and, you know, from ourselves, or from themselves and uh, each other, and which is good. So that they decided that they will have a refactathlon. Oh, this is something, refactoring is like a hackathon. Um, and we already have uh, 300 events. Um, so if you want to help with that, it's like you, you can go and you can try to break our app and put an issue on GitHub and we're going to be very happy about that. So, and I just want to quickly say what, what Code, Week, Code Week EU is. This is a week which is dedicated, it's happening in October and it's dedicated to um, coding. So we are celebrating coding and it aims to get more people excited about coding. So if you have a meetup or a coding club that meets, meets that week, please add it to our nice build app and join us at the Code Week. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph Erika. Now I need uh, Remco Wendt to prepare and Christian Tisma. Chris, are you here? Uh, start walking to the stage where you are next. Now, you have no slides, so you can start immediately. No slides, very no, easy. No, very good, very good. Now give Remco Wendt a big hand for being without slides, totally prepared about our beautiful minds. So first of all, can I ask all of you, just for five minutes, very humbly, to close your laptops, put away your mobile, and just be here for the moment. Ta -da. So I'm Remco, this is Ludwig. I met Ludwig on Wednesday, and I was telling him that I was going to give a lightning talk, and then he told me, yeah, I really want to have some more podium experience in the future. And I said, uh, okay, why don't you join me on the podium? I'll do the talking, but in the meantime, you get some proper podium experience. Give a hand to Ludwig. <laughs> because, because from here on, really, uh, for him, it will be a much easier step to giving an actual lighting talk, and that's what we want in the community. So I hope I can take these five minutes or four and a half to put some interesting thoughts into your beautiful minds. That's also why I called this presentation Beautiful Minds, it's you. I was walking around in the Spanish desert near Zaragoza a couple of weeks ago, and basically for a little while I've been thinking about what will be my next thing, my next business or venture, however you call it. And then it sort of was like, maybe, I should change the world and make it a little bit better, better than the way I found it in. And that's what my talk is going to be about, because then I came to EuroPython and it all made sense. So how does one change the world? Uh, it never starts with big, big ideas. Uh, it starts with big ideas, but 
it's always the small things that matter. We know this from peer to peer. It's like small, individually decentralized elements. You put them into play, but their volume makes it work. So first of all, what I want, to, what I want for you to realize <laughs> is that we're not mere developers. We are the engineers building the future of tomorrow. We have, with what we do, combined our combined effort, we have such an impact in what people do in tomorrow's technology. This is really something that comes, that gives us great power, but also comes with great responsibility. And it's just really, do we, as a community, want our future to be about control or to be about freedom? Interesting to think about. So we have quite a unique position in this. And a unique position is, I've had a few companies before this, and whenever I was hiring tech people, they didn't really care about the money. <laughs> I mean, in the end, they did care about the money. They, they need to have it covered. But the funny thing is that I think most of you here is like, yeah, uh, money, income, we have it covered. So the questions you get as an employer is not like how much money I make, but it's more like, um, how much time do I get to invest in myself? And how much of my time can I, for example, contribute to the community, to code I want to give away, to helping people with making documentation, all that kind of stuff. So actually, it's pretty interesting because what this signifies is that we are taking a step up in the Maslow pyramid, where you have this income thing somewhere in the middle, and if you have that covered, it grants you a lot of freedom. And what happens then? as people start teaching. I mean, I've been involved as a volunteer here uh, with uh, the uh, Open Tech School in Berlin, and people come together and it's like, yeah, we have some time and we like to teach other people. So that's what they do. And they ask nothing in return, but they get a lot in return because I think fundamentally our genetic code is made up in such a way that we care about ourselves first, but then we care about the others. So it's really fundamentally what we are and fundamentally part of our happiness, how much we can help the other. And this community has such freedoms in doing this, it is amazing to realize, I think that most people, and maybe you don't realize it yourself yet, but unless the world economy is gonna collapse, we have great freedom, we have income stability, we have it covered. So, from here, I think what is interesting is however beautiful things we're doing within a community is maybe also think a bit more about how to step outside of the community and how to bring these values outside to other people. Uh, and it's an interesting example today. Uh, I just moved into a new apartment and it's inside an alley. This is the one minute thing. Oh, the last sentencing. Uh, okay, think about this. If you want to hear more, look, uh, uh, search me out. I'll tell you the entire story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thanks. Remco Wendt. Now the first good news, we finished the regular lightning talk list and we are going on to overflow number one, Stackless by Christian Tismer. And I need David Moore. David Moore, like M-O-H-R. Are you here? Please prepare to come to the stage. Our next speaker, Christian Tismer, a long time Pythonista about Stackless best ever, forever. Give him a big hand. Thank you very much. I will be very quick and uh, leave some time for, uh, for the others who, who come after me. I just want to motivate everybody. Uh, you should try out Stackless, formerly Stackless Python, because it has become so much better, very compatible. We, you've got uh, binary installers, which uh, are wor working on OS 10 or Windows. Uh, they are compatible, they run with, uh, uh, with the existing um, uh, packages and other binary installers together. 
you can just put it in, uh, replace your uh, C Python, keep all uh, all extensions uh, inside, or undo that again. It's just fun to do that. You got great debugger support. Uh, debuggers like the uh, the professional Wing IDE, PyCharm, and PyDev. They are all supporting stackless. So uh, binary compatible extensions, which are most important, is uh, PyQt and PySide, and they work great. And uh, so just try it out. Install PySide, for instance. We have a, a pip installer which uh, does that with, with binary wheels, so you can try everything in in half a minute. Okay, then you can run the uh, PySide demos. And I wanted to tell a lot more, but I had not enough time to f finish my slides, so the rest comes tomorrow on the sprint. See you. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> Just in time, stackless as ever. Our next speaker, David Moore, please set up. And Philip Bauer. Philip, can you make yourself visible? He is here. Move to the stage. Our next speaker, David Moore, will talk about Stellar compiling a small subset of Python. And while he's setting up, I've got something for you. What do you get if you cross a rhetorical question and a joke? So if you like better jokes, just mail them to me. OK, you're good with setting up. Schrödinger and Heisenberg will be the next joke, which you can hear on another conference. Now it's David Moore, give him a big hand about Stella. Hi everyone, uh, I'm David Moore. I'm currently studying at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, USA. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about this project I'm working on and I'm going to try to compile a small subset of Python. Uh, so essentially where I'm coming from is we all know Python is fast enough, and that is a mantra I'm not disagreeing with, but uh, unfortunately doesn't work for the stuff that I want to do. Um, and eventually, you know, it's just getting tired to having to, you know, rewrite your stuff in C because you need performance. And I like Python, it works for everything else, so why can't I stick to that? Uh, so a little bit of background about where I'm coming from is uh, we're working on stochastic simulations, uh, kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, which are in itself very, very basic, but you need lots and lots and lots of trajectories. So in the end, it's very, very time and consuming to, to collect that data. Uh, and the code is a little bit special uh, in that it's not like the whole simulation is important. There is no 80-20 distribution. Uh, they don't work with arrays. You don't have differential equations to solve. So a lot of the tools that are highly optimized for Python don't actually work in this situation. Um, and another important part is that you, you get a lot of variants, basically. A lot of different kind of programs that basically do the same stuff, but here and there, they vary. So that's a problem, of course, that's been around for forever, and we all know how to solve it. It's usually with object-oriented programming. So, you know, when we try to speed this stuff up, there's a lot of tools, and, you know, I, I tried them all. And unfortunately, they don't work very well for me. And that, I think that's because they have tiny little bit different use cases. Um, in particular, with them, they all strive for be most inclusive, you know, have being able to use Python as easily as possible uh, when the language itself doesn't have the accelerated feature. Uh, but for the simulations, what you actually want is you want to guarantee that everything runs quickly. Um, so you don't want integration, you just don't want to have to deal with Python at that level because it's too slow. So what I want to do is uh, create a domain-specific language, which actually just is a little subset of Python. Um, you know, throw out the stuff that is not necessarily required to write a simulation, no dynamic features, statically typed, and then implement that as library uh, and support at least a little bit of OO so that I can nicely structure my code 
but I don't have to worry about like all the fancy features which are actually expensive and difficult to implement. Um, so there's my, the approach that I'm taking with this is uh, actually work with a Python bytecode. So I get a lot of stuff for free that Python already does with the source code. You could potentially use multiple inheritance, all that kind of stuff to get to the result that you then want to run and then just transform it to LLVM intermediate and yeah, just run it because at that point when you're doing an ad runtime, we have type information and actually I can statically, I can infer all the types, execute it, return the data back to Python and be very happy. Um, so yeah, this is actually just a quick overview. I don't have any code to present yet because it needs a little bit of cleanup before I can, you know, let other people look at it. Uh, but it's going to be ready to share soon and I would love to get some feedback if anyone's still around on the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. We have two minutes more for a final lightning talk by Philip Bauer. Mosaic, please set up your computer fast. I've got another crowdsource joke from Alex Wilmer. A python walks into the bar. The bartender asks the python, how did you do that? You don't have legs. <laughs> so it must have wiggled into the bar. Um, German conference regulations make it clear that we will have to have a coffee break at half past three. So this is, Achtung! So this is our final lightning talk. Uh, I just want to tell you a little about some of the features we're planning for the future of Plone. This is work done at the Plone Mosaic Sprint in Barcelona earlier this year. And since I can't type fast enough, I'm going to show you a pre-recorded screencast that I actually didn't do myself. So here it is. Uh, this is about uh, custom, co custom layouts and a layout editor called the Mosaic Layout uh, Editor, where, which allows you to create content which uh, Asko Suka, who made the screencast, uh, creates here uh, using the latest Plone version, not Plone 5, like 5 is the future in uh, autumn. Uh, store this uh, theme, this is the uh, Mosaic theme editor, uh, adding a field that was pre-added to the content and adding now static text fields that will be stored on the instance and the theme. Pretty intuitive. This is a rich text editor. And uh, the, th the layouts you can create with this can be re reused either uh, on specific content or whole sections in the site. And they allow you to create, uh, say, landing pages or specific site uh, layouts that you can always uh, use with uh, specific content types. Uh, I'm going to skip this part because it's a little boring, which shows you that you actually can save uh, that um, that layout on, say, a event. So events have a new layout, so you don't have to program your view in, in an editor, but you just drag and drop the fields wherever you want them set these uh, stored views as default views for the instances, and there you go. Uh, the second feature is, um, okay, I was too fast, I can't remember the title, themed layouts, yeah. So here we are creating a new content type with dexterity, uh, which has the layout support enabled. So this is a default feature of Plone. We create a new content type, it's a schema, it's a folder, has the layout feature and navigation route. And this allows you to have a subsite in your Plone site that has its own theme. So here we add a new uh, object, an instance, which is the subsite with the uh, already uh, enabled editor, uh, the mosaic editor. Now we copy content from the default plum site to this new uh, container that we added. And here we set a theme, which is a bootstrap theme now. And now we edit that bootstrap theme with the mosaic editor and add static and dynamic content to that. And all the content that we copied to is there and also uses the same theme. So these, the theme is inherited and com can be overridden by different uh, items. This is another theme built in 
And you see you can pretty easily edit content. This is kind of the future of content layout prototype editing, uh, which you can actually really give um, your content editors. Uh, I'm gonna finish here, so yeah. I think that's pretty awesome. This will land in Plone 5.x, I guess 5.5, 5.1, 5.2, uh, sometime next year. We're really actively working on it, and there's a product called the Inter uh, Plone Intranet product, uh, which will rely on this technology heavily in the future. And um, just one more thing, uh, Nate's just created a option to have free, like zero euros, Plone hosting on Heroku. We will uh, announce that after the sprint. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, that concludes the final lightning talks. We just ran over four minutes into the break. We'll have a coffee break that's 26 minutes until four o'clock. Then the closing will be here, so please, again, give a big hand to all the speakers and the audience. Thank you for enjoying the lightning talks. Have a great time. Be back at 4 o'clock for the closing of the conference.